Hello and welcome back to the Apprentice One to One podcast. It is me, Mark, and I'm excited today to introduce a new guest to the channel. It is Kevin Smith from Sharvin Anna. How are you this morning, Kevin? Hello. Yes, I'm fine, Mark. Thanks very much. Fresh no, off cheers. my holidays, so I'm all full of energy. <laughs> That's it. It's always a tricky one after your holidays. The come down, because you've got to come home, but then you start to pick up, don't you, and get back into the swing of it. So. That's it, yeah. I've had a couple of days now to sort of get back into it, clear the emails, and now I'm sort of, yeah. Back into well, thanks for fully. thanks for taking the time this morning to come and have a chat with me about yourself, um, the brand, and also we're going to discuss power quality because that's something that is massively important to industry. And as we've just spoken about off air, there is limited kind of understanding, I think, of what that is. And I, I speak personally on that. Um, I'm not the greatest expert on power quality. So I'm excited to speak to you today. But before we get into that, Kevin, what is your background in the electrical industry and before that, if you've come from elsewhere? Yeah, so so my background is electrical industry all the way through. I'm an apprentice, time served. Um, I was lucky enough to get an apprenticeship with the the Ministry of Defence. I was a, not, not in the army or anything, but as a civilian MOD apprentice um, back in the day when they did, you know, a really, really high quality apprenticeship you know you actually spent the first 12 months in a, a dedicated apprentice training school still went to college day release but and then you went out into the the workshops and worked with apprentice masters and went through a full you know a really really well invested in well planned apprenticeship so I was really pleased to to go through that route and I did my ONC and HNC and all that lot through there so yeah Fantastic. apprentice Fantastic. apprentice served through that way so yeah electronics was was my my trade originally um, and then after that, I actually went on to be an instructor. So I was teaching apprentices there. Um, and then I left and went into um, what you probably call proper sparking, really. I went to work for a local authority, Reekin Housing Trust, um, and did a bit of time on the tools with them. And then I went on to be a, a clerk of works and then worked for the their asset management department, managing all the electrical rewires and all that sort of thing for their housing stock of about 11,000 houses. Wow. Um and then after that, I went on to set up my own apprentice training, sorry, my own uh, electrical training school. Um, so I was a sitting guilds approved, NIC approved, teaching regs, 2391s, PV, um, yeah, all that all that sort of stuff. And I did that for, for quite a while before getting into the sort of test equipment side. And, and I've been working as sort of product managers and that side of things within test and measurement since then. So you've seen all aspects of industry really it's fair to say and it's, it's interesting because a number of the guests who've come on here seem to have those kind of journeys we start out as um apprentices and then end up in all these strange parts of industry with you know a, a cracking career from the sounds of what you think i think it's a real lesson for apprentices that you just need you need to think a bit wider than just you know being being on the tools you know the, there is that progression there there is that journey and it doesn't necessarily have to be within electrical contracting or within that that sort of, you know, being on the tools or in a van all, all the time. There's a lot of allied trades and a lot of things that are allied to the industry that you can sort of work your way through and and really make your own make your own way into a quite an interesting career. I totally agree. And it, it's fantastic to have you come in to speak with us and to the apprentices on this podcast. So thank you again from Sharvin Anna for doing that. Um and your teaching background is going to help greatly, I think, in trying to explain this at an apprentice level. So <laughs> our, our audience um, is set in that place. Yeah, I'm, I'm lucky I've had it always. I started off training apprentices and then went into being paid to train real-world electricians, which is it's a different world when somebody's paid for a regs course or paid for a, a 2391 course. I remember some of the first courses I actually taught were for some really experienced um, electrical inspectors. And you do, you know, that's the way you learn. That's the way you get challenged by going around all these different environments. I even had a brief spell of about 18 months as a college lecturer as well. So I have seen seen that side of it as well, which, uh, yeah, that's that's a different a different uh, side of things as well. So uh, hopefully I've got quite a rounded, rounded training background. It's a challenging place to go and teach anywhere in the electrical industry. And I've got huge respect for anyone doing it and who has done it in the past. So full yeah. Credit to you, um, Kevin. Before we get into the the topic of discussion, tell us a bit about your current role now at um, Shavinana and the the brand history, because it's quite a long and extensive history, as I learned when I had a chat with it's, you offline. It's, it's amazing, really. I always say we're sort of the 
you know, the the sort of longest served and, and best to test equipment company that you've never heard of, particularly <laughs> in the UK. You know, Chauvin people may have may have come across Chauvin They may have seen some of our earthing products or nowadays maybe some more of our power quality or energy logging products. But Chauvin Arnoux is is a massive um french test and measurement company as the name name probably suggests but in france they're up there with the likes of fluke and mega and at that sort of level you know the 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 group's got i don't know 900 odd employees 100 million pound turnover you know it's it is a massive test equipment company most of the equipment is actually designed made built you know in our own factories in france and and we've got a factory in the usa and a factory in china as well um, but I mean, we started in 1893, so this is our 130th year. So yeah, I've pretty much seen when few, they turned electric I've on. Recently, <laughs> yeah, I've recently seen a few competitors where they're celebrating sort of, you know, anniversaries, and I've looked at that and sort of thought, well, that's cute, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but 130 years, yeah. So originally they started off working with people like Marie Curie. And wow, people along those lines, they invented the clamp meter, so that the first current clamps were Chauvin Arnoux. Really? Um, okay. Even the, the the they did the thing called the universal tester, which was the forerunner of a multimeter. So almost the first multimeter was a Chauvin Arnoux product, this universal tester, as they called it back then. But yeah, one of the first multimeters was Chauvin Arnoux. So massive, massive history in, in, in um, tester measurement. And really, I say it's a hidden secret. So... Um, in the UK, we've been operating for 35 years, just in the UK alone. Um, so I had the chance a couple of years ago now to join, you know, we've got quite a small team, about sort of eight people in the UK. Um, but I had the chance to to join that team and really sort of snatch the hand off, really, when Julian approached me, because um, it, it was an opportunity to actually do something with this brand in the UK, because, you know, it's a massive brand, but it's just just not really known, not really out there. So we've got these great products. We've got, you know, a great brand. And really our job is, I would say, simple in that regard, but it, it's getting that product actually out in, in front of people and actually getting people to realise what, what the French already know is that they've got some, you know, some good test and measurement equipment. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think um, my understanding of the brand would be around power quality and, and data login. But from speaking with you as well, you have a range of equipment. It's, and I know because yeah. I checked the website out, you make uh, absolutely everything. We're just not oh, aware of yeah, it. We've got a catalogue an inch, an inch thick of the, the, the test and measurement products. But what I mean, what we're best known for probably in the UK, but actually funny enough, not anywhere else in the world. Um, but in the UK, we've really concentrated on power quality and energy efficiency because we thought there was a bit of a gap there. There was a bit of a need there was a need for products energy efficiency is becoming massive power quality is just starting to really the penny's starting to drop with people with the grid being under pressure as it is at the moment and you know people are seeing they've got more and more sensitive equipment things like pv inverters and ev charging points that are getting disrupted by poor power quality the grid's straining under all these new challenges so we really saw that, and this was this was very much the vision of Julian Grant, our general manager, when he joined joined Chauvin Arnu, um, was to to you know really sort of stick a flag in in that that part of the industry, that power quality and energy efficiency. And we've really been doing a lot of work. So yeah, so a lot of people do know us from that background, but really we have anything from multifunction testers, multimeters, clamps earth resistance testers. We we do a lot with things like micro ohm meters and and um, you know, doctors for want of a better term, but micro <laughs> micrometers, earth resistance testers. We've got we've got an earth resistance testing set for pylons. We've got all sorts of stuff. So it's now my job really is to start trying to widen that and actually get our name out in front of more um, electricians because we were dealing with a lot of specialists. We deal with a lot of power quality specialists and consultants and people who are really in at that end, but we haven't really got the name out into the wider sparkies really from that side of things so that's really where i've come to the business to try and get the yeah i mean more. that the fact you've identified that and understand that it's actually been a tactic to to do that and it makes sense because if you pitch up into a, an underserved category of industry you know electricians start using your equipment and then they will ask questions well have you got a piece of equipment that does this and does this and it's a natural journey isn't it so i, I totally get that and i'll drop a link inside the description of this video and podcast for anyone who wants to go and look through the website and see exactly the range of products that the the guys have there go and check that out because it is 
it is a vast, vast range, as Kevin has said. The catalogue is over an inch thick, so there's loads in there. Um, but coming back to the, the kind of UK um, sector and the power mm-hmm. quality side of things and your your data loggers, so it's the yeah. the Pell the Pell range, is it? I think you've got yeah, a new the, variant the, the Pels, of that. Out. The pow- power and energy logger, the Pell, yeah. Okay, and um, there was a range. I think was it one hundred to one hundred and three or something like that. Or am I getting? Yeah, so we've got the the three phase ones, which is basically the Pell one hundred range, which is like the Pell one hundred two, one hundred three, one hundred four, and one hundred six. So they're they're these sort of three phase loggers, which is what we've had for for you know for for ages now. Really, that's been the been the staple, and really within the higher sector, a lot of electricians may have hired them from you know their local city's branch or wherever it is. Um, so they're starting to get familiar with the Pels. We're lucky enough this year, we've just had the Pell 51 arrive, which is a single phase one, um, okay. which gives us the opportunity now to get more into the, the domestic market. It's, you know, it's a lot cheaper. It's a, you know, sort of a better price point for electricians, really. And and it, the timing's come perfectly with really more domestic people and more single phase people wanting to actually do power and energy logging. So they don't need the three phase products. So yeah, we're hoping the Pell 51 is going to be really sort of uh yeah really transformative within the domestic and single phase type market it will be a really useful product and i know from my own home since i've installed solar panels and ev charge points that the voltage variance is quite large we've had voltages in the 260 volt range to the point i've had to ask the dno to tap down however they have the issue of when the sun goes in overnight that voltage then drops away due to all of the the generation that's lost from the rooftop so it's a difficult uh, if i can put my conspiracy hat on as well the argument is the higher the voltage the more you're actually paying for electric bill there is also the kva actually goes up if the voltage is high the kva is higher in east yorkshire uh, they certainly keep that voltage that keep that voltage high around here it's usually around the high 240s 250s I, I'm not quite sure that there's a, there's a conspiracy at the heart of it. I think it's more just inadequacies with the grid. But yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard the theories expressed that you know keeping the voltage high actually keeps the electricity bills high as well. But um, it is a problem. We're seeing this day in day out with customers. You know, we're seeing people with EV charging points that aren't getting the performance. You know, the car hasn't charged up in the morning. They don't know why. And when they look at it, like you say, over volting and the charge points just shutting itself down. Same with inverters, pit, you know, poor PV yields because the inverter, every time the voltage goes above a certain level, just switches itself off. So with, with, with power quality then, are we talking about a consistent voltage and frequency, the two kind of dictate what's determined as overall power quality? Is that essentially what it's- it is? It it is. I mean, I always I always say that power quality is is dead straightforward. All we're doing is we're measuring voltage and we're measuring current and we're comparing them against time. So with voltage and current and time, you can work out everything else. You know, your power, your power factors, your frequency, everything else. So it, it's only really making a voltage and a current measurement and plotting them against the time axis. Everything else is calculated. So when we connect up, we make voltage connections. We put the CTs, the current transformers around the cables, and it logs for a period of time. And you really compare in, I mean, quality is an interesting thing. Anybody who's actually ever studied quality, you know, sort of quality from a manufacturing point of view, it's fitness for purpose. It's basically, is it fit for purpose? Does it do what it's designed to do? Is it within the specification? So you could actually have an installation where the voltage is all over the shop, but actually no one cares. You know, it doesn't actually make any difference. (laughs) So really, you know, is it is it fit for purpose? Yes, it is. So really, the the key we get with power quality is actually measuring the installation of looking for these parameters and saying, is it actually fit to do the job? Is it going to cause you problems? So like with your PV inverter, is it going to? So maybe a simple voltage logging exercise over a week would tell you everything you needed to know for PV. But if yeah, you've I mean- got, you know, complex harmonics within a factory or something causing all sorts of problems... Again, you know, you may need to look at different things. There's so much with with power quality, and actually a lot of it is just simple voltage logging, current logging, just those sort of things really is is 90% of what people are actually doing out there. Yeah, I mean, you touched on the the problem with power quality in a domestic space where your EV charge point will, will shut down and not work, your PV potentially the same. But in a kind of a factory environment where this kind of, first became an issue i would say it was data centers would be my initial place i guess this problem would crop up way back when when it was important um you start to get damage to equipment or loss of supply because they'll have 
voltage monitoring in terms of over voltage and under voltage. So it's a, it's a tricky one at that regard, isn't it? Because then you have equipment shutting down, motors wearing out more quickly than otherwise would be anticipated. So there's a financial cost of that, not just the inconvenience of your car not charging up. There is. And also what we find a lot is, is change. So you'll have an electrical installation that's designed from new and then something will change. I mean, we went out, Julian and I actually attended site for a, a, an installation in Northamptonshire. And we went out there and they got problems with power factor. And we looked at the power factor was atrocious. And we looked at the power factor correction. The power factor correction had been in there about 40 years. And it had been installed before they changed all of the motors over to variable frequency drives. So they replaced all the motors in the factory. They installed <laughs> variable frequency drives and left the original 40-year-old power factor correction sat in the corner. Half of it wasn't working. The other half was making the power factor even worse. We actually switched <laughs> it off, and the power factor improved. Um, so what you see, really, and this is what we encourage people to do with you know with power quality, is this continuous, you know, just keep checking, keep looking at these things, because anything that changes, and this is the same with the supply, you know, the utility company will go and change a transformer, or they'll upgrade a supply, or they'll change something. And that then causes problems down the line. And like you say, people can be having high failure rates. They can be having equipment burning out. They can be having these nuisance tripping events and things going wrong. And they just don't know why. And a lot yeah. of times that's the conversation we have. Somebody will phone up and say, I've got all these problems. I don't know what to do. And that's when we'll say to them, right, get a power quality analyzer, log for a period of time. Let's have a look at the results. Let's yeah. see. And a lot of times, the actual faults are generated from within the installation, not necessarily outside. So you've got two different things going on there. You've got things that are generated by the supply, but you've also got internally generated problems as well. Yeah, I mean, that's that's you made a couple of fantastic points there, that, you know, about the cause of the problems within the install itself, but also going back to the the, the power um, factor correction. You see that on a lot of these new panel boards that go in now. They will have monitoring built in to the power quality um, units where they will adjust themselves as well to try and kind of keep up with that shift invariant because even in the, the best circumstances, it moves around a little bit day to day based on what's going on externally and internally. So we're kind of recognizing that more in, in new designs, but going back to a lot of the older installations as most are out there, you know, they're a good 30, 40 years old and we're kind of rework and reutilize them to get a full lifespan of um, value from them. It's difficult, isn't it? Because that monitoring's not there. It's just been put in way back when and people just assume it works. They don't understand the need to change and adjust it as the equipment that's installed changes and yeah. adjusts. I mean, so it, being it, able to measure it and prove that with the data is absolutely key. Even simple things like circuit balancing across three phases. You know, people come in, they add a load of single phase loads onto a particular phase, throw everything out of balance, increase the neutral currents. It, it, these things happen within the installation. I've been sort of lobbying for a while, really, to get a few of these basic power quality checks done as part of ECRs. You that know, things sense. like THD, total harmonic distortion. Just do a simple THD measurement, and that will tell you, have you got a harmonic problem or not? You know, how much is the harmonics that's there? Simple maximum demand, you know, the, the simple measurement of what's the actual loading on the installation, you know, the load sense. balancing, all these things. They, they'll never get done unless they're done as part of an EICR. That is so true. And it's a good reference point every five years or so to take a look at that, isn't it, I would say. Um, so, yeah, that's a good shout, actually. Um, yeah. it's something I mean, all of this stuff is in the do. regs. This is the point. <laughs> I actually did a webinar last year where we looked at the regs and power quality and energy efficiency, and all of this stuff is actually in the regs. You know, cable sizing, when you're doing cable calculations, there is a correction factor in there for harmonics. Yes. But nobody ever measures it and nobody ever applies it. No, it's one of those things, isn't it, that just gets forgotten aside from maybe at the design stage where people may be considering it. So you're right, as electricians, we should be looking at this a bit more. I mean, my understanding is, and we mentioned this off off air about the linear and non-linear loads. So in, mm -hmm. in the past, the linear loads would be kind of your heaters and your lighting, I would say. And now our non-linear loads are like the, the variable motors that you mentioned and um, your switch mode power supplies high frequency power supplies and things like that led, LED lighting now pretty much no, we swapped haven't we from linear to non-linear virtually everything is is now non-linear loads and and non-linear loads are really interesting because a lot of times when they're when they're fully loaded they actually perform better than when they're when they're ticking over 
And it's always a fun one for us when we do a, a sort of harmonic survey. You see all these harmonics appear and you're going, oh, God, you know, these harmonics, these massive harmonics everywhere. And then you look and there's like one or two amps on the circuit. Okay. Because they're actually just ticking <laughs> over. And when they're just ticking over, they're chopping that waveform up and creating all these harmonics. And you're suddenly panicking, thinking, oh, we've got this massive harmonic problem. But actually, it's only a few amps ticking over on the circuit. So really, it isn't a problem anyway. And that's why I was talking about fitness for purpose. And sometimes when people look at these things, it does take a little bit of reading, a little bit of understanding with these, because it is not just an absolute number. Yeah, you're right. And kind of you would initially react to seeing it on a graph in the same way you just described. I'd be exactly the same. Like, what's going on here? And you start to maybe delve a bit deeper than than you really need to. So getting some educational content out there maybe around power quality. I mean, there's probably specific courses for this. I'm sure there is, but it's not something that's readily available in the electrician space. Maybe going forward, now we are moving into this prosumer world and it's more of a factor for us in terms of operating systems not just getting the best lifespan out of equipment maybe we should be looking at that if i could do a bit of a blatant plug if you have a look on our show for our new youtube channel um i actually did a load of webinars last year i did about nine odd webinars last year three of which actually start off with power quality and energy efficiency and go all so they're about an hour long each and they Perfect. take you all the way through one of those is about power quality energy efficiency and the wiring regs so we actually refer to the regulations, the examples, and take you all the way through. So if if anybody is actually interested in, you know, getting a bit of an introduction on those, uh, we've also done ones on insulation resistance testing. We've done ones on earth testing. We've done ones on all sorts of different topics. So, again, these are just really based around, you know, the application with a little bit of product chucked in. They're not they're not designed to be salesy. We've, in the UK, what we're trying to do at the moment, we are a small team and we're trying to differentiate really by being approachable by doing the educational stuff by actually supporting the application because we recognize that actually this is quite a, a young market it's quite a fresh market and actually a lot of people aren't buying a power quality analyzer not because they don't want one but because they don't know that they even need one yet <laughs> it hasn't even got there so we've got all of that education to do first so we're very much starting from that point and again if anybody you know needs to find out more you know we're we're freely available you know people can just phone us up we get this day in day out people just phone up and say i've hired one of these i'm getting this what's it mean what's it do can <laughs> you come out to site and help me with it and all that and the answer is always yes because you know that's what we're trying to do at the moment in the uk and i'll drop the links to those videos again in the description of this so go and go and check them out i'm going to certainly give those a watch because i didn't know they were there kevin so i'll, I'll check them out myself um but talking again about the 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 power quality issue and harmonics it's often mm -hmm. something that people chuck around in discussion i do it myself that the harmonics you know what what actually are harmonics what are we talking about there is that a, a multitude of frequencies what what is it? It, it it's generally harmonics the way i look at it is it's frequencies other than 50 hertz so everybody's taught you know electrical installation you have this beautiful sine wave um which is 50 hertz and it might be 49 point something, 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 or it might be 50 point something, something, something. But generally in the UK, it's pretty stable. So you've got this frequency, you've got this AC frequency working. Now, what happens is when you get, as we talked about, these nonlinear loads and things like that. So let's use something simple that apprentices will probably be familiar with. So say you've got a basic rectifier, a basic bridge rectifier. So you've got a basic bridge rectifier circuit that then chops it up from being this nice sine wave to this Loch Ness Monster style <laughs> waveform. So you've basically created then a multiple, you've created a harmonic, you've created a, a, a signal that's at a frequency that's drawing current at a frequency other than 50 hertz. So when you start getting quite complicated rectifiers or switch mode pass bars, they're drawing current at frequencies other than 50 hertz now the problem is if you only measure what's been drawn at 50 hertz you may be missing a big chunk of the current that's actually going down that cable you're actually missing that because you're only measuring at 50 hertz and we actually have this a lot with our clamp meters our clamp meters have got a very wide frequency response and the power quality analyzers have got a very wide frequency response whereas there's a lot of products out there on the market and we've actually seen and proved this that literally only measure the current within a very few hertz either side of 50 hertz. They're tuned for the fundamental frequency. So you okay. literally put your clamp around the cables and you could be measuring five amps and there's actually 10 amps flowing in that cable. But because you're only measuring 
watts at 50 hertz, that very narrow frequency band, there could be another four amps at like twice that or three times that. Or So when we talk about things like THD, total harmonic distortion, that tells you what percentage is actually in the harmonics and what, you know, and obviously if you flip that over, what percentage is at the fundamental. Wow, so in so theory, that... you could have currents that you're not seeing or not allowing for that's actually there, but you're not physically seeing it. Um, yes, and that's a big deal when you're sizing cables and you're, you know, doing all these sort of calculations. And it is basically that simple. There is, there's a wide range of frequencies of current in there, not just 50 Hertz. Um, and the more complicated the loads are, these nonlinear loads, all these electronic things are chopping all this up and creating this fast response. You know, if you look at a power quality analyzer, and you'll see that in the, the webinar, you can see the response. And you can see what frequency, what currents you're getting at what frequencies. Um, and actually, when you go up the frequencies, as frequency increases, you actually get more heating effects and things like this as well. So actually having higher frequencies can actually have more detrimental effects as well. Yeah, that's what I was gonna gonna lead on to there. So we're saying, like you just referenced, that we might only be measuring a certain element of current at fifty hertz, and then there's a big chunk of it perhaps elsewhere in a different frequency band, and and then surely that would have heating effects on the cable and equipment and your terminations, and everything's going to be under more more strain and stress. So it makes sense to to get this right because we don't want to be back swapping LED lighting too often. We don't want to be going out changing yeah. motors under warranty because as electricians we don't get paid for that do we we just been yeah. sent to do warranty and often, unless you measure it with a with a, an instrument like a power quality analyzer or a, you know like like our clamps that have got a wide frequency response and stuff like that you will you won't know it's there um yeah. and it's actually there you've seen things overheating you're, sitting, you're going how's that breaker how's that breaker keep tripping how does that breaker actually keep tripping you know i've measured it there's only I don't know, 30 amps there. What What's going on? You know, why am I getting this? And then you look at it and go, oh, actually, there's another 10 amps of harmonics that are there that are causing this. You know, it, it, it happens a lot. And RCDs as well, you know, we're all familiar with these type B RCDs now and stuff like that. How many people know that the actual frequency response of those is up to one kilohertz? Mm, not many, I would say. So, so the actual frequency response <laughs> of modern RCDs, a lot of modern, the modern RCDs, actually have a frequency response up to one kilohertz. So we're now looking into this with leakage clamps. So we've actually got a leakage clamp that actually measures a wide frequency band as well, because a lot of the leakage clamps actually only measure leakage at a specific frequency, yet we're, we're supposed to design installations and actually take into account the full leakage currents. Um, well, that makes sense. Same thing again, isn't it? If you're going out to a trip in RCD and you're using your clamp meter and only seeing 20 milliamps for, for want of a better example they could actually maybe be 25 and that's why it is occasionally going out because it's at a different frequency band that's really interesting so it's um, it's it's something we're trying to you know we're trying to sort of do more on this and try and do more experiments really and try and find out in the real world are the are the are, the, are people actually having that exact situation where there's nuisance tripping and it they're literally not seeing it because the test equipment they're using is just designed for you know, a specific frequency. Um, so it's something, you know, we've done a few articles with our, our F65, our leakage clamp. Um, that's actually quite interesting because it's got a button on for a filter. So you can actually apply the filter for 50 and 60 hertz and it'll show you what's at 50 and 60. And then you actually show you the full frequency response and you can actually see the difference between the two. That's it. And the data and knowledge is power for us as electricians. And it, it's with all things, we can't even see the voltage and the current. So we should be measuring... The, the frequency aspect of things as well and what's going on within that um, to help us install better at the end of the day. And it's it's an interesting one in the domestic market because as people are having all of this PV installed, I think we're just at the start of that journey now. We're pretty much going to end up with most properties, I think, over the next 15 odd years or so oh, yeah. with, batch, batch with PV generation. And, yeah. and it's getting longevity out of the inverters and things like that as well. It's not just a case of having them so they'll work. So there's obviously a lot of engineering that needs to go on with this around the DNOs as well, isn't there? Well, this is quite yeah, a big I mean, thing. The, D, the DNOs are playing catch up massively. <laughs> you know, they're really struggling with harmonics, and they're they're trying to work out what 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 does all this micro generation mean for harmonics? How can they even deal with that? How how does your harmonics affect your neighbour? You know, all these things. How does everybody in the street suddenly installing heat pumps with variable frequency drives and motor controls and battery systems and electronic inverters and it's such a complex system and really that's where unless you can actually measure it and actually log it and get into it you know is is 
uh, yeah, it, it's how do you start? I mean, we've been having conversations recently with customers about maximum demand. We went down to a block of flats actually in London that had been converted. Um, it had got um, a, a six-way single-phase head, um, so 100 amps for the whole block of five flats and a landlord supply. So the head was looking really sort of ancient and all this. Um, and the DNO was sort of saying, well, really, you've got to get it all ripped out. 100 amps isn't going to be big enough, so you need to have the whole lot ripped out to the street. It's going to be tens of thousands of pounds. Um, and the poor electrician was there, was scratching his head going, how do I do maximum demand calculations on this? How do I actually work out what the maximum demand is of all these flats? And, you know, I've got to go into, I've got to work it all out. And I stumbled across him through Facebook, actually, because he was asking on Facebook. He was actually in a group on Facebook going, what do I do? How do I do this? So I said to him, we'll lend you a logger. So we actually lent him a pal. We logged for a week with a big, we used a one meter CT to go around all of the, the supply. And for this block of flats, five flats plus a landlord supply, I'll give you a thing, if, unless you've read read the article that we've done. I on haven't read it. No, I haven't. I... So go on then, maximum demand. Do you want to put a number of amps on it and guess how many amps this block of flats was actually drawing? What what the peak was at what one moment in time at about seven o'clock in the evening, I think it was, or nine o'clock in the evening, we actually got to a peak. Do you want to guess what the actual peak was? I, I will certainly give it a guess. I, mean, I imagine it's going to be lower than I would have expected, but <laughs> I, I, would, I, I would say, I don't know, 150 amps. 48 amps. Wowzers. So, I mean, that 48 amps was the maximum that got to over a 12 day period. It's incredible, really, isn't it? And I think we do all use much less than we realize as a, as a peak in, in most terms, to be fair. <laughs> but you look at these flats, the way it was being used, you know, this was all, all a lot of it was older people. They'd got gas central heating, they were using the gas for the water, you know, they're doing this thing. And you could literally, I mean, it's really interesting. We did an article on it, but you can see the the trace of like the people getting up, you know, seven o'clock in the morning, you suddenly start to see these kettles goes on. <laughs> Little 10 amp spikes for like three minutes dropping off. And then you see these, uh, and, you know, it's really interesting to see all this stuff. But actually, that gave them the evidence to go back to the DNO and say, no, we don't need this upgrading. Here's the evidence. We've actually logged for a period of 12 days. In the winter, this was as well. So they could actually say, this is pretty much worst case scenario. What we just need, we need the service head tidying up, the tails replacing and upgrading or whatever. But we really don't need a three-phase supply pulling out all the way back to the street and rejointed and all this. And it actually saved them a hell of a lot of money. Uh, and that yeah, was just okay. a simple current log for 12 days. Of course it will. I mean, it'll save immense amounts of money rather than digging up the street and pulling in new supplies yeah. and there's no point putting but, it, but it's evidence-based how would you do that yeah. with your maximum demand calculations and your you know 30 year old values out of the on-site guide that say when you've got a cooker you add five amps on for the socket and you add it that hasn't been changed in how long certainly yeah. that's not as far as i've never known it be anything different throughout my career so um maximum demand and the more complicated going back to our original point the more complicated all of these installations get the only way to do it really now is to measure mm. now that is, you're right it is you won't have foresight without measuring it i wonder if they'll end up stipulating something with a lot of these domestic homes where there has to be i don't know elements of battery systems that aren't just for kind of running alongside the grid and they run in exclusion of it and then charge up at separate periods if that makes sense so it becomes more of a trading arrangement with the grid so they can kind of schedule people if you get what i mean rather I'm sure than there will be you know this sort of central switching uh, and i think i think a lot of the things with the smart metering and all that was designed around that being able to send these signals down the down the mains cables and turn things on and off and a lot of load switching and like you say even demand switching then the other way around of not dropping loads off but actually adding loads back in and i did even see originally that they were talking about using electric vehicles in the same way that you know they would almost be a two-way a two-way street i'm not quite sure how that works really because generally when it's plugged in you want it to charge and when it's not plugged in you're driving it so yeah, I mean, that's yeah. the other thing of using your expensive vehicle and battery to supplement um, an infrastructure that's not working is something that'd have to be, be hard suitable sell. tariffs, you know, it'd have to be suitable sort of compensation or, you know, we'd have to work out financially from that side of things. But it's only going to get more complicated and it's only going to get more sort of interesting really for us over the next 10 years, probably as electricians. But at least, like you say, if we're measuring for it, we can then spec equipment that's maybe more robust to some of the issues that may be prevalent in an installation or do something about, you know, correcting. I mean, it's difficult at a domestic level to engineer in a great deal of something that would help you, 
you know, correct the power quality issues. Whereas on a, a commercial system, there's generally budget to try and allow some efforts at, at doing something about it. So it's not easy, but awareness of it is very, very important. Um, and we'll certainly be doing more of that because you made a great point that it is actually in the regs and we should be doing bits and pieces on this. Yeah, I mean, you know, you talk about design and verification courses. I mean, I used to teach teach the 2396 and that was before I got into all this side of things, really. And sadly, you know, I, I could hear myself now going back going, it's for posh installations. Don't worry too much about that in your calculations. You know, don't overcomplicate your project. You know, don't worry about all the, you know, you're doing your harmonic calculations. Just put it in your assumptions and say, you know, assuming that the, you know, the THD is within acceptable limits, assume it, you know, don't make life hard for yourself. But actually, by doing that, we're not actually fully arming people for the modern world. We're not actually training people to to understand these things. And I think you know, regs courses, and I've, I've done a lot of regs courses, you know, when the 17th edition came out, I taught over a thousand electricians for the, uh, for the, 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 the 2382 or whatever it was then. Um, and you don't have a lot of time. You're covering stuff that's in the book. You're going through, try, you know, say, trying to pass things exam. You try and get knowledge into people, but you don't have the time to go fully into, you know, the likes of harmonic currents or even the other half of what we do is power quality is a big bit, but, you know, energy efficiency is one of the main things that we're actually doing with power quality and energy loggers as well, because energy efficiency now is becoming this massive driver. You know, we're getting energy managers or an electrician, you know, somebody will come to you and say, I need to save money off my electric bill. What do I do? And generally that's when they come to us. And we say, well, first thing you do is put a pell on their log, see what you're using out of hours see what you actually are using. Have you got a problem? You know, prioritize, right? Yeah. LED lights will save you this. And we know that because we know what your current lights are, are using because we've got a graph of it and we can work it out and actually putting business cases together and all that sort of thing is a really important part of, you know, what we're doing as well. It is. I mean, evidence in the energy savings you can make for a customer, that's a big upsell for us as electricians. So I think that's a, a great idea. And I know that there's, installers out there doing that right now we've done a little bit with led surveys so it's, it's something that's going on but maybe not as much as it should be um it's, it's interesting times to see where we're heading with all of this and you know measuring for power quality and data is a key part of it so i would say to any apprentices who are kind of on their learning journeys now go and check out the content that kevin's got over on the youtube channel and, and learn a bit about it because it's going to set you apart further down the road if you know this stuff rather than if if you don't and for electricians who are out there like me and maybe not touch this since way back when, when you were in education yourselves, have a brush up and look into it because it's becoming there's, there's more of a... opportunities thing. out there, Mark. There certainly is opportunities for people who know these things and understand these things. And and we're seeing it day out, day in, day out. People are now are hiring these pels a lot. You know, they're coming to us with these issues. And, and a lot of it is people, this is really their first delve into it. You know, they've sort of... I've heard about it. I'm sort of, I've hired one, you know, I'm sort of in there. And and that's where we do a lot of hand holding and taking people through these things to try and get them up and running. And then the next thing, you know, I've bought one, I've bought one. And then the next thing goes, I bought two. I bought, th I've got this one out on this site. I've got this one out on this site. I'm just getting, you know, and, and we do have some customers. I mean, we, we worked with a company who was doing some testing on a data center and they'd actually hired 18 of our power quality analyzers and they'd got 18. They were doing some commissioning on a data center, the UPS for a data center. And the data center said, you must prove to us that when the power goes off, <laughs> that there is no disruption, literally not even a blip disruption to the outgoing side of the UPS. You know, we mean uninterruptible power supply means exactly that. So they actually had 18. They were monitoring all the, all the phases, all the cables, all this, and actually monitoring the input and the output of all of these systems to prove as part of the commissioning that these things were actually rock solid. Uh, and that's happening more and more and more. But you can imagine the complexity of 18 of these things. You know, I did actually go out on site and help the guys with some practice runs and getting stuff set up and things as well. But that's when it starts getting a bit interesting. I bet it does. And the graphs and output from all of that must be a really good insight to, <laughs> to what can be. Can well, be hopefully achieved. it's a nice flat line that stays exactly the same. Yeah. <laughs> no blips and wiggles and stuff. Yeah, but uh... yeah, that's it. It's, it is, it's, it's an interesting subject and, and topic. And um, I need to do more learning on it. That's one of the things I've identified through talking to you on this podcast today. And it's why I love doing things like this, because... I get far more out of it than um, I give to these discussions. So thank you very much, Kevin, for coming on and sharing a bit of your time talking about that. Is there anything else you want to cover 
before we leave it, I will um, drop links over to your social media and the um, Shavin and her social media channels in the description. But if there's anything else you want to mention, please follow oh, Only it. really from us. It's, it's just the fact that, you know, just pointing out the fact that we are here. <laughs> we, we are we are more than available you know you you can literally pick up the phone and speak to me now virtually you know in the next 10 minutes or whatever i i deal with a lot of the tech support you know we go out and seeing people we go out and support people and if you've got an interesting project we love case studies we love to actually go out if somebody's got something like that block of flats you know we're more than happy go out lend somebody the equipment have a look at it. We'll chances are we'll write it up. We're doing a lot in Professional Electrician Magazine and Energy Manager Magazine at the moment, writing up a lot of these case studies and product reviews and things just to get the word out there. But so if anybody has got one of these things where they're going, I've got this issue, but I don't, I don't know. You know, we're more than happy to literally come out and you know put a tester on site for you and have a play with it and see what's going on because we're as interested in it as you. You know, one of the things with us, particularly Chauvin and in the UK, is we are you know we're time served apprentices. We are nerds, really, in in regard to this <laughs> stuff. We do find it interesting, you know. We're 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 not in any way really salesy, you know. We 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 obviously we like to sell test equipment because that keeps the lights on, but really we've got a passion for it within the business. And what we're trying to do is just get the word out there that you know there is this application there. We recognise that people need helping with that, whether that's an apprentice or whether that's a a fully fledged spark who's just starting with their business to look at these things. We're here to help. Get in touch. Fantastic. And as I say, there'll be links in the description. Please do go and, and check them out and hit them up with your questions. And it's great that you've got confidence in the product to put it in people's hands, knowing that they're very likely, once they've seen the data and understand why it's important to measure it, to go off and, and buy this equipment themselves. It, it, it just sells itself, really, from that regard. And we get in there. And, and that's where we try, you know, we do try and do the things. We're aware there is other products available, but we believe that we've, you know, the support and the level of hand-holding and support that we give to people just makes people choose us every time, really, once they start looking at it, which is great. Um, just one final thing for apprentices. If there is any apprentices out there who need any help with anything or need any information or you know in general please feel free to connect with me on any of my social media or connect with us Chauvin on any of the social media give us a shout because you know there is a wealth of knowledge within the business that we're more than happy to to share with people so if there's anybody out there who's struggling with any of the concepts or anything in general please just get in touch absolute legend i really appreciate your time today kevin thank you for coming on to join Thanks us for having me. Got... it's been great I, I, I love talking about this stuff <laughs> I think we all we all do. Everyone who gets involved in these podcasts, me and Neil often say this, we're all kind of a bit nerdy for industry and, and it's good. I really enjoy talking about it. And if anyone's got any questions in and around the discussion today, please do drop them in um, in the YouTube comments or over on some of the social media platforms where I'll be sharing this. And until the next time, we'll see you then. Brilliant. Thank you. Bye.